שנה טובה. I haven't even started yet. If our synagogue's present construction serves as any indication, then on that first Sabbath of creation, when the good Lord stepped back to behold the divine handiwork, the Wi-Fi was nowhere near close to being hooked up. <laughs> Printers not connected to the mainframe, furniture was sitting in a shipping container on a dock in New Jersey somewhere, and some angel had forgotten to install the phone jack in God's office. <laughs> Why did God wait until the fifth day to fill the land, sea, and air with living creatures? Now I know. Because the angel entrusted to fill the TCO, the Temporary Certificate of Occupancy, <laughs> chose that week of all weeks to go on vacation. <laughs> Park Avenue Synagogue, welcome back to 87th Street. As a staff, we re-entered the building on September 4th, but I imagine for most of you this evening, Rosh Hashanah is your first time to behold all of the progress and all that's still in progress. As I've reflected many times from this bima, it's of deep significance that when the world was established, the adjective God used to describe creation was tov, good, not perfect, not flawless, certainly not complete. There's still work to be done, there are details to be tended to, and we're all looking forward to the formal dedication on Sunday, December 8th. But even now, it's incumbent upon us to pause, to take note of how far we've come and appreciate all of the tov, all of the good, to say thank you to you, our membership, for your shared vision, support, and patience. And while our entire leadership under our chairman, Mark Becker, and president, Natalie Barth, are deserving of thanks, I'd be remiss if I didn't publicly express gratitude to the synagogue officer who has shepherded the construction every day, every step of the way, the indefatigable, the one and only, Craig Solomon. You know, having never lived through a building project of this magnitude, I naively believed that the sequencing of construction projects was a fairly straightforward undertaking. <laughs> Construction is announced, construction is completed, and construction is enjoyed. What I've discovered, what everyone else seemed to know but never told me, is that nothing could be further from the truth. Construction is messy. Punchless take time to complete. And the act of creation extends well beyond the date of occupancy. In fact, as the rabbis tell it, far from a crisply sequenced undertaking, the creation of our world, what today Rosh Hashanah is all about, was a similarly frenetic, deadline-busting effort. Pirkei Avot, The Ethics of Our Fathers, relates the anxious hours prior to that first Sabbath, theologically speaking, this precise moment, when God remembered a list of 10 items previously overlooked. 10 things that had to be rushed at twilight, including the rainbow to follow the flood, the manna to sustain the Israelites through their desert wanderings, and the tablets upon which the Ten Commandments would be engraved. What a great image, one that I hope gives our fabulous executive director, Beryl Chernoff, some comfort, that even God had to stand there yelling at the foreman to get the job done on deadline. As I researched these midrashim, these rabbinic glosses to the Genesis story, I discovered that there are actually different lists scattered throughout rabbinic literature describing different things that God created prior to creation, including the Torah, the Holy Temple, and God's throne of glory. But of all the things on all of the lists that needed to be created prior to the physical universe coming into being, the most remarkable, the most curious, 
And the most relevant for our purposes today is not actually a thing, but an idea, a concept, a behavior, and that is tshuva, repentance. Tshuva, repentance, stands alone, an idea without which the world itself would not and could not exist. So I began to wonder why. Why would God need to create tshuva as a precondition to creation? The first answer, I think, requires some knowledge of another midrash that teaches that God had actually created prior worlds before our own, but each one disappointed and none of them actually worked out. What was missing in these earlier creations? What was missing was the one thing we all know we need in order to handle our world's inevitable disappointments, setbacks, and shortcomings. Tshuva, the ability to see beyond the slight, to see the big picture, and to move forward. Only before this, our world was created, did God finally understand that in order for this world or any world to endure, it would need some give, it would need to forgive, like a skyscraper built to sway in the event of an earthquake. Tshuva was a give built into the world in order to withstand the imperfections to come. It's a sweet thought, but it lacks precision because strictly speaking, tshuva doesn't mean forgiveness. Tshuva means repentance, namely the ability of an individual to reflect on the past to feel remorse over one's actions and to resolve to choose a new course of action into the future. By this thinking, tshuva had to exist prior to creation because it's a precondition not just to the world, but to our very humanity. As a great sage Maimonides taught, there are two fundamental theses upon which our humanity is based. First, that every human being is endowed with the ability to distinguish between good and evil. And second, that every human being is endowed with the ability to choose their actions. Simply put, without tshuva, without moral agency, human beings would not be human. And it's that idea that tshuva is what makes us human that's the premise of these high holidays, the theological ante, if you will, for the days ahead. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur wouldn't make any sense if we didn't believe that we had free will, that we can repent our past and choose a new course of action. This evening we commit to shedding all the excuses we employ year round to justify our behavior, that we were just doing what everybody else is doing, that circumstances were beyond our control, and that ownerless mistakes were made. To believe in tshuva means that we need to look back on the year knowing that we did know better, that we did have the choice, and nevertheless, we made bad choices. All the rationalizations, deflections, and justifications, all of them need to be checked at the door. There's another midrash that teaches that when a child is conceived, an angel brings a fetus before God, and the angel says, will this child be tall or short, and God decrees the child's height. And then the angel says, will this child be good or bad? And that, God is silent, because moral volition is not a matter of divine decree, but individual choice. To believe in tshuva is a bold challenge to us all, because it means that our mistakes belong to nobody but ourselves. But we can nevertheless, if we so choose, rise up to our God-given potential. But that still isn't the full picture. The creation of tshuva at creation is not just about God, nor for that matter, just about me and you. Tshuva is actually about other people, or more precisely, about all of us. Because if you believe, if you truly believe that you and I can be reflective, remorseful, and change for the better, then you know what? That person who wronged you in the year gone by, you have to believe that he or she can change as well. The person who caused you hurt, the one who demonstrated such poor judgment, the person whom you've benched indefinitely from your life, that person is also capable of reflection. That person is also capable of regret. That person is also 
capable of course correction, and that person may just be worthy of forgiveness. One of the most enigmatic midrashim regarding creation tells of God's decision to create humanity with the ministering angels debating over whether man should be created. Love said, let him be created for he will do loving deeds. And truth said, let him not be created because he will fall short of truth. Righteousness said, let him be created because he will do righteous deeds. And peace said, let him not be created because he will bring discord. On and on they debated before God, the Midrash teaches, until God sees truth and threw it onto the earth, thus creating man. I'll be the first to admit I don't fully understand the text, but I think part of its message is to teach that in order for humanity to be created, truth had to be thrown to the ground, lest any one human being claim to be in possession of it in its entirety. None of us are in possession of the whole truth. There's always another side of the story, and during the days ahead, we need to be open to hearing it. I'm well aware that I have personally caused people hurt this past year. When I know, I reach out. I call, I email, I write a note, I ask someone for coffee, I do whatever I can to seek forgiveness. When someone reaches out to me to share that I let them down, that I caused them offense, I try my best to resist the urge to be defensive. I always try to remind myself that there are two sides and I only have one. I don't know if in the days ahead we will resolve all the hurts of the year gone by. It's a tall order. But I do know is that if we fail to allow for the possibility that neither you nor I are in possession of the whole truth, if we fail to allow for the possibility that our loved ones are as capable as ch of change as we would think ourselves to be, then this entire season of repentance will not amount to very much. I imagine there are all sorts of reasons why tshuva had to be built into creation, why it was a precondition to the existence of our world. It's a sort of question we should all be thinking about during the holidays. But it was last week, as I was writing late night in my new office, the Wi-Fi is now up and running, that it finally hit me. I got up to stretch, and I was taking a stroll through the building, and I saw all of the construction workers and maintenance professionals working around the clock and through the night, these angels in hard hats, working furiously to put our building back together. Not a new building, but a return to our old one. Return not to its former glory, but to a beauty beyond what any of us imagined possible. A building that honors all that came before and is poised to house an infinite number of memories to come. And I thought to myself, well, if that isn't what the high holidays are all about, then I don't know what is. And I remembered that the word tshuva doesn't just mean repentance. The word tshuva from the Hebrew root meaning to return, shuv. Tshuva is a word that signals the possibility of a return home and the promise of a new future at one and the same time. Why did God establish tshuva at creation? Because God wanted us to be able to feel like we felt when we re-entered the building this evening. The feeling of coming home hand in hand with the appearance of the new, the familiar intermixed with the unfamiliar, the sense of comfort right alongside the thrill of the unknown. In other words, a sensation that we're entering into a new chapter of our existence. That's what tshuva feels like. That's what these high holidays are all about. And that's why God had to create tshuva before our world came into existence. God knew that over the course of our lives, we would wander and go astray. And so God gave us the divine gift of tshuva, of return, of finding our way back home, even as we step forward into new territory. This is the promise of this building. That is the promise of these holidays. Friends, welcome back to 87th Street. It's beautiful, it's new, it's tov. Actually, it's tov me'od, it's very good.
and it is your home. This is the place where you belong. A new building, a new year. Let's make the most of it. Shana Tova.